Hey everyone. So this is part two of the SLS core stage production overview. It is just an overview, even though it's long, um, but hopefully it's informative and hopefully we can use it for uh, reference uh, going forward for future builds. The SLS core stage is one of the biggest items for NASA Artemis missions, literally and figuratively, and it's also one of the biggest pre-launch watch items. Delivery of the stage to the Kennedy Space Center Artemis launch site is usually a good indication that launch preparations are close to getting underway. For the first three missions, Artemis 1, 2, and 3, the stage is at the center of the vehicle, conducting launch and insertion into low Earth orbit. I wanted to run through some of the hardware pieces and some of the milestones that can be general indicators about overall progress or the status of a build, but there's a lot to cover. The core stage is the most complicated and youngest piece of SLS, so I split the production overview into two parts. In the first video, I went over what the stage is, what it does, and some of the machinery involved. In this video, I'll provide an overview of how Prime Contractor Boeing puts the core stage together. So, as noted, the most complicated element of the core stage by far is the engine section. It is where the engines are mounted and where all of the rocket equipment and supplies come together to feed the engines during launch and steer the engines during launch. The engine section is where most of the main propulsion system resides, from propellant feed lines, valves, and manifolds, to pneumatics for operating the propellant equipment, to hydraulics for operating and pointing the engines, to the avionics box controllers for all those MPS parts, and of course the engine power heads themselves. There's a lot of equipment for the different aspects of the MPS, which are packed into a pretty small area inside the engine section barrel. Most of the barrel's volume is taken up by the bottom of the LH2 tank, since the aft dome sits completely within the barrel. The engines attach to the bottom of the thrust structure, so almost everything else is packed into the area below the tank dome and the top of the thrust structure. That includes all the propellant feed lines and other lines, like the fill and drain lines and the liquid oxygen anti-geyser line. Each of the four engines takes a feed of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, so those eight lines have to fit inside. The engines also have outflows of fluids, and there are also valves and manifolds as the lines branch from one junction to another. The hydraulic systems are mounted to the top of the thrust structure on TVC platforms. There is one hydraulic system for each engine, which also provides some level of redundancy for failures. Auxiliary power units, reservoirs, accumulators, recirculation pumps are affixed to those TVC platforms, which serve both the TVC actuators and the engines. Each engine is gimbaled by the stage with two TVC actuators, pitch and yaw, and the engines use the hydraulics from the stage for valve actuation. There is some additional space around the circumference around the outside of the dome. As an example, the five MPS pneumatic helium tanks are attached to the barrel walls. The MPS valves are pneumatically actuated, so those are also plumbed into the feed system that connects to the five tanks. The engines also use pneumatics for purges and valves, and the plumbing for four sets of those is also inside. Something else that fits in that additional space inside around the edge is a shelf that holds most of the avionics that goes in the engine section. The overview slide condenses installation and test of all that equipment into a one-liner, integration. That's the longest and most work-intensive part of production, but engine section production begins with parallel assembly of the barrel and thrust structure. The barrel is welded from eight barrel panels in the VWC. It then goes to the VAC, where an L-ring is welded to the top, forming that flange where the LH2 tank will bolt together with it much later in production. These are shots of the core stage 4 engine section barrel when it came out of the VAC. On the inside of the barrel, you can see the taped areas that show where the internal thrust structure and supports will fit. You can also see the bare metal locations of the weld lands between the panels and at the top where the ring was welded. 
The panels are delivered to MAF now pre-treated with primer, but those bare metal areas are still exposed and the barrel goes to cell G for primer to be applied to the weld lands to prevent corrosion. In parallel, the thrust structure is bolted together and outfitted with hardware on its own assembly jig. That is done with the thrust structure upside down. When ready, that is flipped over and set up in the floor assembly jig or FAJ. Then the barrel is brought over and lowered down over it. The two structural elements are then mated together with over 2000 bolts. You can see a lot of the bolts by comparing the exterior before and after bolting. Here's the core stage 4 barrel again, obviously without the thrust structure or the bolts. Here's a shot of the core stage 3 engine section structure after it arrived at Kennedy Space Center in December 2022. We're looking at the zero degree plus Z side with black covers where the tail service mast umbilical plates will eventually be and the beginnings of one locks feed line downcomer entry point. But you can see all the bolts in the area. The bolt pattern at the bottom essentially outlines where the thrust structure is inside. This is a side-by-side -side shot of the core stage 4 engine section barrel on the right after that additional primer had been painted in cell G being moved past the core stage 3 engine section structure on the left in the floor assembly jig. This picture was taken in July of 2022. Once structural assembly is complete, then the engine section is moved from the FAJ to another work location for integration of all the equipment previously detailed. For the first two builds, that was several feet away, but beginning with the third build, the completed structure was shipped to KSC to the Space Station Processing Facility, now called the Space Systems Processing Facility. At a high level, the integration is done in similar phases to what we saw with the Orion spacecraft builds. The fluid lines are brought in and connected with orbital tube welds. Then all the wire harnesses are brought in routed around the area and connected into components that are remotely controlled. Major sub-assemblies like the TVC platforms are integrated outside the engine section and then brought in pre-assembled. Those four platforms come in and are installed along with the five large helium tanks. The avionics boxes are brought in, mounted to the shelf, and connected into the wiring. The bow tail is a short extension and fairing bolted to the bottom of the engine section that includes the locations of exhaust ports and access panels for some of the equipment inside. It is also the base heat shield for the stage where different thermal protection system elements are attached, such as the engine mounted heat shield blankets that protect the power heads of the four RS-25 engines. While engine section integration is in work, the parts of the boat tail assembly are put together in its build-up stand. Some wiring and fluid tubing runs across the interface between the engine section and the boat tail, and the boat tail side of that orbital tube welding and wire harness installation is done pre-mate. You can see a little bit of that with the core stage 2 boat tail assembly when it was moved to cell A in building 110 at MAF for stacking with the engine section. This was back in the middle of 2021. Going back to the overview slide, it shows that for the first build, the boat tail assembly was attached to the bottom of the engine section after element integration was essentially complete. That timing and sequence has evolved based on lessons learned so, so that on the second build, the engine section boat tail stack was done in the middle of the integration phase, which allowed the additional integration and testing work to be completed in parallel. Now that engine section integration is in Florida, stacking it with the boat tail assembly now requires several days of transportation beforehand. Right now, the boat tail for core stage three is stuck in New Orleans waiting for a ride on NASA's Pegasus barge. So Boeing may be rearranging the core stage three engine section integration sequence again to account for additional delays in the arrival of the boat tail. The large propellant feed lines are brought in towards the end of integration. Many of those are composed of sections that are bolted together. As engine section integration gets closer to completion and all the different subsystems are outfitted, functional testing at the engine section level begins.
Things like leak checks of the orbital tube welding and bolted flanges occur at this point. The continuity of wire harnesses are also tested. The outside of the barrel is outfitted with its thermal protection system. The engine section is mostly covered with cork panels, which are then painted to provide a moisture barrier. Some areas, like the aft reaction structure beams that support the LOX feed lines, get manual TPS foam sprays, and inside all the cryogenic equipment is insulated with foam. A lot of the feed line elements are pre-treated with foam, but valve assemblies and closeout areas have to be left until after those parts are leak checked and functionally tested before they can be covered with foam, since the TPS covers up access to the parts. As an example, the issues with the pre-valves on the first core stage that were mostly discovered during the Green Run campaign at Stennis Space Center required the clutch mechanisms to be replaced which required the foam to be removed to gain access to the pre-valve assemblies. Once the element level functional testing of the engine section boat tail is complete, it is ready to be mated to the rest of the stage. The next most complicated element of the core stage is the inner tank, which has the second largest amount of equipment inside. Similarly to the engine section, there's not much room inside the inner tank once the propellant tanks are connected. The aft dome of the LOX tank and the forward dome of the LH2 tank take up most of the volume. Right in between those is the thrust beam that the SRBs pick up the rest of the vehicle with at booster ignition and liftoff. There's also the two liquid oxygen feed line S ducts that run from the bottom of the LOX tank through the inner tank interior and then outside. The rocket equipment is installed in the leftover space around the domes along the inner tank walls, but that doesn't happen first. Production of the inner tank begins with structural assembly of the panels and the thrust beam. Those are loaded into the inner tank structural assembly jig and then thousands of bolts mate the structures together. The inner tank panels are not only bolted to the thrust beam, but to each other, unlike the panels of the other elements that are welded together. Once the structural assembly is complete, the next phase is TPS applications. The inner tank is removed from the structural assembly jig and transported across the main Building 103 complex at Michoud, from the forward structures area on the east end to cell G in Building 114 on the west end. Cell G is one of the TPS spray booths from the shuttle external tank production days, and it's now been converted for SLS core stage use. The exterior of the inner tank structure has intersecting ribs. Some run around the circumference and some run from top to bottom. That creates rectangular pockets that first are filled with foam installation that is sprayed manually. The inner tank is sitting on a turntable in the cell and once the manual spray foam has been trimmed, an automated spray coat is applied over that. After the second coat of foam has been sprayed, it is trimmed and then the inner tank is lifted out of cell G, placed on a barrel assembly and transportation tool, or BAT, and moved back over to the forward structures area for integration. The inner tank doesn't have much in the way of orbital tube welding, but a lot of wire harnesses and equipment are installed during the standalone integration. Brackets that are also known as secondary structure are, are added inside to provide places to mount some of the equipment. Ducting for environmental control system or air conditioning is also located inside. Similarly to the engine section and forward skirt, during integration the wire harnesses are brought in, routed around the interior, and initially connected to simulated avionics boxes that are 3D printed. The avionics boxes and equipment are eventually brought in, installed, and connected. This diagram of the avionics for the SLS Block 1 vehicle shows some of that equipment. The four primary batteries that provide electrical power for SLS equipment beginning 90 seconds before liftoff, the redundant power control and distribution units, one of the rate gyro units, 
the box that relays the propellant levels in the tanks, the cryogenic level sensing system, a data acquisition control unit, a camera control unit, and one of the command and telemetry controller units. Once those units are installed, standalone functional testing is performed using electrical ground support equipment. And then when standalone functional testing is complete, the inner tank is more or less ready to be mated to the other elements. The other dry section, so to speak, is the forward skirt. On the Block 1 vehicle, the SLS flight computers and redundant inertial navigation unit, or RINU, are installed there. One of the two command and telemetry controllers, CTC-1, is also located on the forward skirt, along with environmental control ducting. Production of the forward skirt begins with welding of the barrel in the vertical weld center. It then goes to the VAC where an L-ring is welded to the top and the bottom, since the forward skirt will be bolted below and above. The L-rings help form the flanges where the forward skirt is eventually bolted to the LOX tank on the bottom, and then way down the road, it is connected to the launch vehicle stage adapter during stacking in the vehicle assembly building at Kennedy Space Center. Eventually, on the Block 1B and Block 2 vehicles, it will be bolted to the inner stage. Once welding of the structure is complete, the forward skirt is removed from the VAC. It goes into one of the spray booths, likely cell Q, so that the weld lands can be coated with primer spray. Then it goes over to the forward structures area for some pre-TPS applications work. TPS applications are the next phase of production. The forward skirt is moved back to cell Q, where the exterior of the barrel is robotically sprayed with foam. The element then moves back to the forward structures area for integration of its equipment. Integration follows the same general pattern of installing any remaining brackets, layout and connecting of wire harnesses, and then installation of the flight computers, the RINU, and the CTC. Standalone functional testing would then occur to verify that integration is complete, and the forward skirt is ready to be mated to other elements, which we'll get to. The propellant tanks are the biggest elements of the stage, but have fewer moving parts. Production of the propellant tanks often will begin later in the overall build for a particular unit. Starting with the LOX tank, it is composed of two barrels and two domes. The barrel panels are welded in the VWC. The domes are assembled from a Y-ring, a gore body, and an end cap. The gore body is welded from 12 gore panels in the gore weld tool. The Y-ring is welded from six forgings in the segmented ring tool. Those are then put in the circumferential dome weld tool and welded together. Finally, the end cap is loaded into the tool for the final dome weld. The domes and barrels then head to the VAC where they are welded into the full tank structure. After the tank is removed from the VAC, parts of the baffle assembly are installed in the bottom of the tank. Then it goes to plug welding. The VAC welds leave a hole where the friction stir welding tool is inserted and withdrawn. The plug welding seals that hole. The next step after plug welding is proof testing. For the LOX tank, it is taken back to building 110 to cell F for hydrostatic proof test. The tank is installed in the cell vertically and loaded with water up over the lowermost circumferential weld for proof testing. After the proof test is completed, the tank is removed from the cell, rotated back to horizontal, and it goes to another processing cell for another set of non-destructive weld inspections. Non-destructive evaluations, or NDE, are performed on the welds before and after proof testing to make sure that they have not changed. After the NDE weld inspections and the remainder of baffle installation is finished, the tank goes over to building 110 and is rotated to vertical again and installed into cell E this time for an internal cleaning wash down to remove any debris from inside. Going forward, the inside of the tank will be kept clean and dry, with a purge of dry air running through it much of the time. From cell E and internal cleaning, the tank once again is rotated to horizontal and is prepared for its external TPS applications. 
It then moves into cell P in the adjacent building 131 for an automated spray of primer over the entire exterior for corrosion protection. Each of these steps involves a lot of oversight and quality control, and describing it in a sentence or two just scratches the surface. But we're trying to summarize three years of production down to a handful of minutes, so there's that. After the corrosion protecting primer coat is applied, the tank is then prepared for application of the distinctive color changing spray on foam insulation or SOFI. That occurs in cell N next door, although the tanks don't necessarily move directly there. For the first couple of builds, several development flight instrumentation sensors and a lot of wiring runs covered the skin of the propellant tanks. Most of those wiring runs end up buried under foam, so they have to be configured so that the connecting ends aren't covered with foam and can be hooked up and interconnected later in production. Similarly, other areas on the tank ha need to be masked off so they are not covered with foam, like the flanges or with the first two tanks with sensor islands on the skin of the barrels or entry exit points for the vent valve assembly or pressurization line. Once those preps are complete, the tank is moved into cell N where automated foam sprays of the barrel quote unquote acreage and the domes are performed. Different types of foam are used for different applications and the robotic foam sprays have their own special formula and application requirements. After the SOFI sprays are completed, another automated task performed in cell N is to machine down a trench in the foam along the length of the barrel where the system's tunnel will be mounted to the tank. After additional trimming, the tank comes out of cell N. At that point, the foam still has a very light cream color to it. Going back to the slide, we see the next steps are installation of the sensor mast and installation of the sump. The sensor mast is installed inside the tank with the level sensors to provide measurements of how full or how empty the tank is. The sensors on the mast, for the most part, are part of the cryogenic level sensing system, CLSS, that is used to pace loading of the two propellant tanks on the ground, and in-flight sensors at the bottom of the tanks let the vehicle computers know when it is about to run out of propellant. Here we can see what those readings look like in the flight control room during the final Artemis 1 launch countdown. The sensor mast is installed while the tank is horizontal, and that was done after it returns to one of the processing areas in Building 103 from cell N. For installation of the sump, the tank has to be vertical, so it goes back to Building 110. The sump fits over the bottom of the tank, but there are a set of fasteners that have to be secured on the inside of the tank, and that's a job given to someone who gets to be lowered through the manhole at the top of the tank, all the way down to the bottom to get those fasteners. The sump is eventually closed out with spray-on foam, given all this hardware is conveying cryogenic fluids. Similar TPS sprays to close out other areas on the exterior of the tank are also completed before the LOX tank is ready for mating with other vehicle elements. The LH2 tank goes through a work outline similar to the liquid oxygen tank. The domes and barrels are welded from their piece parts, the barrel and gore panels and rings. Then those are welded together in the VAC to form the full LH2 tank structure. The tank is rotated to horizontal for a plug weld tool to seal the VAC welds, and then the tank is ready for its proof test. The LH2 tank proof test is a dynamic pressurized test. The tank is rolled out to building 451, which is well south of the main Michoud complex of buildings. LH2 tanks are tested pneumatically in building 451 by pressurizing them with gaseous nitrogen while loads are being simultaneously applied by a hydraulic test ring. After proof testing is completed, the tank comes back to building 103 where welds go through NDE inspections to verify their integrity. Then the LH2 tank follows the same sequence noted previously. It goes vertical in building 110 and is cleaned internally in cell E. Then it is returned to horizontal and prepped for TPS applications, first going to cell P for primer sprays.
Then the tank is prepped for foam sprays and it is moved into cell N for application of SOFI to the barrel acreage and the domes. Similarly, a trench is robotically machined out of the foam in the location where the system's tunnel base plates will be mounted on the LH2 tank. That machining is also done in cell N. The tank then returns to building 103 for similar post SOFI installations of a sensor mast and the aft manifold. The overview slide notes the sensor mass installation inside the tank before the TPS applications of primer and foam. But at least for the first build, the sensor mass was installed after the TPS sprays in cell P and cell N. In contrast to the sump on the LOX tank, installation of the aft manifold on the bottom of the LH2 tank can be done while the tank is horizontal. Following that, the LH2 pre-valve assemblies are installed on the aft manifold. Once other closeouts are complete, then the LH2 tank is ready for mating with other vehicle elements. A series of joins occurs to connect the five major vehicle elements together. This slide shows the sequence that was practiced for the first two builds. This differs from the original production plan and a little bit with how final assembly of the elements will occur in the future and also where final assembly will occur. For the first two builds, the top three elements of the stage were joined first, with the inner tank being set up in one of the vertical stacking cells in building 110, followed by the LOX tank being lifted on top, and then the forward skirt goes on top of that. That is called the forward join. After the elements are physically bolted together, all the functional connections between the forward skirt, LOX tank, and inner tank would be completed. Those two liquid oxygen feed line S ducts that run from the bottom of the LOX tank and the sump there through the inner tank interior and then outside, those are also installed at this point while the forward join remains in the vertical stacking cell. Then things start to change from original plans. Originally, the plan called for an aft join. That could be seen in the 2017 and 2018 slides, at least referred to. Once the engine section standalone work was complete, in that plan, it would roll into building 110 and go into cell A, one of the vertical stacking cells. In there, the boat tail would be attached to the bottom of the engine section, and the LH2 would be brought in and stacked on top. Then the functional connections between the engine section and the LH2 tank and boat tail would be completed, followed by the standalone functional testing of the engine section and aft join in cell A. That assembly would be rotated to horizontal, rolled over to the final assembly area, and made it to the forward join. Engine section integration for the first build was late and long, and so Boeing came up with a new final assembly sequence that was used for the first and second builds. The aft join was deleted. Instead, the boat tail was attached to the engine section and then the functional testing was performed on those two elements in the final assembly area at MAF. In the meantime, the LH2 tank was mated to the forward join also in the final assembly area at MAF, creating a four-fifths subassembly. That allowed work to continue on the four-fifths elements in parallel with completion of the trailing engine section work. A series of functional connections could then be made between the intertank and the two propellant tanks and also allowed the largest section of the systems tunnel to be attached to the area on the LH2 tank using a special tool. That change to the core stage one build in early 2019 allowed Boeing to complete the stage by working around the clock through most of the year, delivering the stage in the first week of 2020. Once the engine section and boat tail integration and functional testing were completed, that was then moved over to building 110 to be rotated from vertical over to horizontal. That required a counterweight to be built to temporarily be bolted on top of the engine section, along with modifying one of the transportation tools. After the engine section boat tail was attached to the transportation tool in the horizontal, it was then brought back over to final assembly at Michoud 
and physically join to the rest of the stage. Once the five elements were a mated unit, the rest of the final assembly sequence was basically as originally planned. The four RS-25 engines were then brought in and installed while internal and external connections were being completed between the different elements. On the outside of the stage, the system's tunnel, repressurization lines, and the locks feed lines have to be installed and completed. Once all of the hardware installations are completed, a final integrated functional test, or FIFT, is performed on the whole stage to verify it's a working rocket stage and ready to go to KSC for stacking with the rest of SLS. Then there's a final few weeks of TPS closeouts and installation of covers and fairings before the stage is ready to ship to KSC. That final assembly sequence was retained for core stage two. Right at the moment, as we record this in March of 2024, it has completed FIFT and is waiting for further directions on finishing those final few weeks of closeouts and basically when it's going to be shipped to Kennedy Space Center. That is still up in the air again as we record this in early March 2024. In terms of future builds, Things changed again at the end of 2022 when Boeing announced that it was moving engine section integration and core stage final assembly to Kennedy Space Center beginning with the third unit as noted earlier. So where the final assembly plan is today is that the four-fifths subassembly of the upper four elements, the forward skirt, LOX tank, inner tank, and LH2 tank will be completed at Michoud and then transported to KSC. The engine section structure for Core Stage 3 was transported to Kennedy Space Center in mid-December of 2022 for the full integration sequence. One of the changes to the assembly and transportation plan for the 4 fifths is that a variation of the aft join is being revived. The LH2 tank will be stacked on top of one of the simulators repurposed from Core Stage structural testing. Then that will be mated to the forward join in the final assembly area at MAF. The simulator has the set of physical hookups that the engine section does, which allows the four fists to use the same overland transporter and also to be secured to the agency's Pegasus barge with minimal changes. Boeing is working on integration of the engine section for Core Stage 3 in the SSPF at KSC right now. There's no current forecast for that completion date, but when it is complete, it will, be, it will be moved to the final assembly facility that Boeing is building in High Bay 2 of the Vehicle Assembly Building. Unfortunately, there's no current forecast for the completion of that either. In the meantime, at some point, Boeing will get the go-ahead from NASA to complete the pre-ship outfitting and final shipment preparations for Core Stage 2 at Michoud. As shown earlier, once all the TPS work is complete and the fairings, blankets, and covers are installed, the stage is rolled out of final assembly and over to the transfer aisle of Building 110. In there, the stage is lifted by the two heavy cranes up so that the indoor facility transporters can be moved out and the overland transporters can be moved in. Then the stage is lowered down and secured on those transporters. Finally, a weather cover is installed on the front end of the forward skirt. Okay. At that point, the stage is ready to roll out to the Pegasus barge. For the first core stage, rollout of MAF occurred on January 8, 2020. There's about a mile or so of ground to cover on the grounds of the Michoud Assembly Facility, with the stage being taken out of the main Building 103 complex area, down to the turn onto Saturn Boulevard, and then down to the dock. It will roll onto the Pegasus barge, and once weather conditions permit, they will leave New Orleans headed for, in the case of Core Stage 2, Kennedy Space Center for the Artemis II mission. Thanks for watching this video. These production overviews only scratch the surface of all the details.
However, I am hoping to reference them occasionally as we follow production of Core Stage 3, 4, and future builds. Thanks again.